Hey guys, this is Tim from Simpsons Learning Lab and welcome back to part 3 of the 3D printer control uh, box. Now in this video we'll be installing this thing underneath uh, my 3D printer and we'll also be taking a look at the source code that's used to yeah, basically run the system. So let's actually uh, get right root and dive into the source code. Now, Welcome to the desktop. Uh, this is actually one of my first projects using Visual Studio Code and Platform IO. I was actually doubting if I should use uh, Visual Micro, but that required a license. And I was looking into uh, why I needed a license. And then I remembered, hey, we've got Platform IO, uh, which is, well, actually, it works really well. So I can really recommend it. So we start off with the printer controls. Uh, this one is used to pin the Wi-Fi task to a certain core um, as we are using free uh, RTOS, free AirTOS a uh, little helper define uh, if you want to output the, the sensor values onto the serial console now next we've got the various uh, log tags that are used to identify each uh, login call made so you can disable enable certain logging modules now that's not really working on the ESP uh, and the Arduino ESP32 it's only working on the ESP IDF uh, so here we've got a config.sdk config UART that's used to disable the hardware flow control since it interfered with the DHT22 uh, you can define the local logging level over here, but that's being overridden or overridden by the decor debug level. Uh, so these are the, the logging things, these two and third. Uh, we of course do have a, a task watchdog timer. Uh, so if a task fails to reset the watchdog within 8 seconds, uh, then the ESP resets and restarts. Uh, then we've got my home environment library. That's a library for managing Well, basically the device uh, when you initialize it. It will read the uh, Network information the client ID and if applicable the MQTT settings from a JSON file from the internal file system and will initialize everything and It will be a very easy thing uh, for the end user to call since you don't have to worry about uh, cross-platform or cross-chip compatibility just initialize it call initialize and loop it uh, in each loop now I've got a couple of peripherals this for I squared C DHT rotary encoder PZEM now please be aware I'll write it down the PZEM004T that's used in this project is the version 2. The protocol, the communication protocol between version 2 and version 3 are not the same. So if you're planning to use version 3, you'll need to change a couple of things in the source code for this project yourself uh, before you can actually use it. Now this is for the uh, home environment library, but uh, as I said, uh, I recently made an update that stores this information inside the internal file system in a JSON file. Uh, but you do need these, and therefore also these. These are the topics that the printer control box will respond to. Now over here you can configure the threshold, uh, basically the idle power consumption of your 3D printer. That's important to know since the printer power box will automatically stop measuring the current voltage and energy being used when the printer goes back to idle so it yeah you need to to tweak that i think that two watts is reasonable since you've got the screen microcontroller and a couple of fans that are on uh, rotary encoder here you can define the rotary encoder pins pin a b they are all labeled up top over here. Now this is for the DHT 
and various output pins and light dimming polarity. Now, depending on which uh, transistor and MOSFET you use, it might be inverted or it might not be inverted. So change that accordingly. Uh, light channel, this is for the internal, let's see, uh, peripheral, the PWM frequency, 10 kilohertz and a 8-bit resolution. LCD digits are one, well, that's not used anymore. Uh, so over here you can configure the watchdog timeout. So this value is in seconds. Uh, every 800 milliseconds the screen gets re-rendered and it uh, is able to force re-render if the rotary encoder has been used. So push, either push or turn, then it will force re-render it. It will also do a force cycle of the, the actual active menu page. You'll see that in a moment. Uh, PZEM timeout is the time to wait before the um, UART request times out. So before a new one gets sent. Uh, loop delay, update delay. Uh, if you want a higher update value, you can decrease this value, but 400 milliseconds is right about on the edge. And then of course you'll also need to lower the PZEM loop delay. And if you lower them too much, other tasks will start to get the watchdog timer uh, being triggered. Uh, DHT timeout, yeah, that's one second, the DHT loop delay. Uh, the DHT is able to acquire a new value every two seconds, so 2200 milliseconds is a very nice value. Let loop delay how many times per second the brightness gets adjusted. Rotary encoder loop delay, 10 milliseconds, we want a nice and sharp and fast response. Now, max of brightness, this is the maximum amount of light uh, you can go to when the printer is off. The idea of this is that when you're only using the PZEM12 uh, as a power supply that isn't able to handle uh, 300 milliamps, it's only able to handle 200 milliamps. And when you've got your printer off, those LED lights will, well, needs quite some current. So the idea of this is that when your printer is off, the PZEM doesn't get overloaded. Now here are all the, the data structures that are used for storing data inside the queue. As I said, this is a free RTOS um, source code. So it uses queues to communicate between tasks. It uses a queue for the PZEM. Uh, DHT activation data, so when the printer started actually heating and printing and stopped printing. A queue for the display, a queue that's used to store uh, publish requests, so to store information that needs to be published onto the MQTT server. And a rotary encoder queue that's used to store rotary encoder events. Now up next we've got a menu. There are a couple of menus, well off, if the menu is off, the screen is off and there will be no text. Then we've got finished, so in the finished power menu it will display the power consumption uh, in uh, kilowatt hours or in watt hours, but I think kilowatt hours. Uh, during printing it will display the power menu and then the voltage and the amperes and the other power menu will be the power and the consumed energy. It will also display the environmental statistics, the environmental and ambient uh, sensor data, so the DHT, temperature, humidity. And it will have a couple of menus for the connecting, connected and connection field. And it also has a menu for the printer off. So that when you push the button, it will say, hey, printer is off, press again to turn on. So up next, you've got the forward declarations of various functions. You've got the creation of the rotary encoder, the DHT, and the management variables for the DHT. 
some of the uh, muxes well not all of them are used i think only the dht is used and then comes the menu interval uh, stored, uh, stores the uh, remaining time in milliseconds before the next menu item cycle uh, then the task handles that are used to reference a certain task the various semaphores and then comes the uh, then come the interrupt wrappers now they are needed because a call is made to a function of an object and uh, that's not applicable for an interrupt function since they need to be uh, static and not part of a class so over here the rotary encoder task is also woken to allow for more CPU time for the rest of the tasks uh, same goes for this one these two are this is the turning of the rotary encoder and this is the button uh, then the setup function we initialize serial initialize the light output and over here you can see that I uh, commented out the log level set function since they basically don't do anything uh, then we create the various queues that store the uh, information uh, we can allow 24 MQTT publish requests to be stored inside the queue then we check if the queue uh, is not null this is very important since uh, if the queues are null then the rest of the uh, source will also not work and then we create the semaphores now usually uh, i create them with x semaphore create binary but for some other reason the semaphores are not working if i do that uh, so i create them with v semaphore create binary and then the asserts will also pass and these asserts will also pass then we de initialize the watchdog to again enable it with my uh, watchdog timeout and we start the tasks now if you're not sure what this means i'm going to prepare a new youtube series that will cover free artos uh, on the esp8266 and the esp32 uh, so stay tuned for that so there's uh, a delay in between starting the tasks to prevent a deadlock simple as that and in the regular arduino loop we uh, delay the task with the maximum available delay time since yeah this is not uh, used now we start with the first task the dht task uh, this is all the initialization code and then it goes in an endless for loop um, where it gets the data it acquires the data it puts it into the MQTT uh, queue over here and it also resets the DHT queue to prevent any um, old data from being in the queue and then it publishes it to the DHT queue and yeah that starts all over again um, every 2.2 seconds oh and it also resets the watchdog which is very important otherwise the SP will just restart LCD task same story initializes everything clears the LCD enables the backlight uh, sets up everything and prints a high value to the screen very useful for debugging so therefore I uh, didn't remove it it sets the default menu upon boot which is Wi-Fi connect menu and every loop we do a render and pass this variable over here and the LCD reference so it knows where to render and what the active menu is and over here you can see that um, this task this for loop waits for 800 milliseconds until it gets notified so it waits to get notified for 800 milliseconds if it didn't get notified then it just uh, continues 
and renders and waits, no notification, continuous renders. But if it gets a notification, so if the return value of this function is pd pass, then the thing got notified. And as you can see, uh, we are going to force a menu cycle um, since that's what the user wants. Uh, and that will also allow the system to respond very quickly to a button press. And uh, when the notify uh, returns PD pass, the blocked task, in this case the render or the LCD task, uh, is unblocked. So if this function was blocking for 200 milliseconds and a notification was sent, it unblocks. It renders and then it waits for 800 milliseconds. Not sure if that makes sense. I think it does. So that's a very snappy menu. And then again, we don't need to call the delay uh, since that's already been done over here until a notification comes in or it doesn't come in. Now, next up, we've got the LED task. This is the dimmer task over here. Set up the, the dimmer and let's see. I think that LED controller peripheral. Um, yeah, just a basic uh, semaphore for the LED brightness, since that's also set within the callback of the MQTT. Uh, publish or subscribe uh, callbacks. Semaphore for the LED brightness, since that's also accessed from the MQTT callback. And the activate semaphore, same story. When it's not activated and the brightness is bigger than the maximum allowed of brightness, it will reduce the brightness. And of course, give back the semaphore. Then it will dim and publish a MQTT state topic with the current brightness. Wait, reset, go all over again. So the Wi-Fi task, now this task is uh, being run on CPU 1, zero based, so the second core, the others are all run on CPU 0, and that is to prevent the uh, Wi-Fi task from getting interrupted by the scheduler to, for example, dim the LED or something. Uh, since the initialization of the Wi-Fi task can take quite some time, opening for reading from the internal file system, doing the SSL things. I thought it was best to actually run it on the second core. Uh, yeah, we set everything up, uh, the heartbeat, false connection callback. This is where you subscribe to all the topics. And this is also the place where the uh, menu is set to connected. And this is how you actually set a menu you send it to the queue and then the LCD task, the render function will read from that queue and if there's something available, it will show that on the screen. Initialize and boost the Wi-Fi power just to make sure that it got uh, enough power. And on Wi-Fi event, now this is a little bit experimental. Uh, this is how I pass the home environment pointer to this uh, lambda function and yeah the, the idea is that the home environment will also handle the wi-fi events so disconnect uh, lost a uh, ip address all that stuff but it's a little bit experimental right now and when it all got initialized it will just loop all over again um, there is a while loop that checks if the publish queue is empty. If it isn't, it will receive it, it will publish it, and will make sure to reset the task watchdog. And if there is nothing in the queue, it will just continue. So the PCATM task, well, we start off by disabling the hardware flow control on UR2, since that's the, I think it was the RTS pin is the same pin as the DHT's data pin, so that uh, interfered with each other. We set up the PZEM uh, hardware serial, the IP, uh, set the update interval, 
Now this is the update interval that the PZEM will internally pull the PZEM at. Um, it's a library that's adjusted by me uh, because there, but there, because the original library didn't use a UART interrupt, which makes for a much more efficient code since we don't have to wait for new data to become available um, and we can just continue with live basically uh, therefore I also added the uh, Arduino-ESP82 uh, GitHub repository I created a pull request and that's still pending um, but if that's merged then You've got a UART RX interrupt function that this thing uses. Otherwise, you can just clone my GitHub um, to get that same functionality. Again, we take the semaphore to protect this variable. We initialize it, and when the pzem.update function call returns true, then new data is available uh, and it's parsed successfully and it will uh, set all the data to the mdata energy check if it succeeded or it failed and gives takes the semaphore again and sets the variable and gives it back now this is the point where the mqtt publish data uh, data to be published gets prepared and this is also the point at which the PZEM queue gets filled with the current data. So the data that's being published and the data that's shown on the screen is the same. And over there we've got the activation data. Now this is the part where the printer uh, controls box detects if the printer is currently printing or if it isn't. So if it's just started or if it's just finished and then it does things with that puts it in the queue or oh, first it resets the queue and then it puts it in the queue so this is a queue with a single item in there so yeah then you ask why even make a queue well that's because the queue is used to protect and to access the the uh, data from different tasks and if I didn't use a queue, I would have to use semaphores, which internally is also a queue. And semaphores makes for much more code since I need to call this. And I need to call this. And if this one fails, I don't need to call this. If this one succeeded, I need to call this. But now it's just a single call. Uh, this one actually. Then again, waits and loops all over again. Activate printer. Now this is the function that actually activates the relay and makes the uh, menu go to the uh, VA so the voltage and the current screen that's where it starts at deactivate function uh, yeah this just deactivates the function and uh, either it goes to the finished power menu or it just shuts off the LCD so this is the MQTT callback function and we check for a printer power topic so over here you can see that the callback or the state publish is being made uh, but not from the activate printer function which is what we want here we check if the incoming topic is the brightness change topic or the light power topic now this is the render function now for efficiency I created two uh, buffers for the first and the second line I cleared them, I cleared the LCD to prevent unwanted things from being shown and please keep in mind that this is called every loop every LCD task loop this is the place where it checks if the menu needs to cycle uh, it also pulls the rotary encoder event and then it uh, cycles the menu through a switch case uh, structure so pretty handy oh yeah this is the place where the printer off menu so printer currently off please press 
will activate the printer. And then, so this is the switching of the menu and this is the actual rendering of the menu. It will pull all the data from the different queues and it will process them and put them inside those two buffers. So respective, uh, that's of course different for each menu. And then at the end, yeah, or if it's the off menu, it will just do no backlight and nothing gets printed. And at the end, we'll do another clear home and print both lines. Now the rotary task, that's the last task. It will set up the rotary encoder. It will register the interrupt wrappers and it will just loop all over again, see if the encoder changed. And there's some logic over here to prevent unwanted button states from getting published onto the queues. Now that's important because otherwise the uh, render function will think that the button is being pressed when you only rotate the rotary encoder. And with this logic, uh, that's not the case anymore. And as you can see, when it should publish something, it first publishes it. Otherwise, the task will wake up, look into the queue, nothing is there because it hasn't been published. And then, so first published, and then we wake up the task and wait for the thing to actually render. Same for this, uh, we wait until this thing gets notified. And what we could do is we could check the return value of this and if it isn't uh, pd pass, so if it didn't get waken up, we could skip this. Make for a little bit more efficient code. So I'm going to fix those two bugs real quick right now. I'll upload this code and then I'll take you to my 3D printer. So we're at my 3D printer. As you can see, it's nice and cozy over here with a lot of stuff. It just shifts you a little bit. And obviously we've got the printer control box over here. Now this is intended for the Credity CR10S. I'm not sure if the CR10S and the CR10 have the same uh, base unit, but this just goes underneath like so. It will just sit on top. And this is the, the, the cable that's connecting, as you can see, the thing just booted up and it's off, activated, yeah. So let's just heat the bed and see what the power consumption is. I'm expecting around 150 watts, maybe 200 watts. Let's see, 12 watts, well that isn't correct, wait for it to cycle, 1.5 amps, 262 watts, which is looking a lot more like it. Go. So yeah, that's uh, actually working really well. 270 watts, so let's just turn this off. So guys, there you have it. There's my little mess of a printer area. So guys, I thank you guys for watching. As always, I've got all the relevant links in the description down below. So I really encourage you to check it out. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye. Oh, hey, hello. Uh, I, I wasn't expecting you over here. Well, if you want, you can also view two other videos of me. So make sure to click them. And don't forget to subscribe and like so you always get notified of my new videos.